You know, I'd like to give a title to the message today, Women on a Mission. Women on a Mission. And we're not going to leave the men out, but uh, today we are thanking God for those who have had a significant part in all of our lives. In Ruth, the third chapter, and the latter part, well, let's just read beginning at verse 10. Ruth chapter 3, verse 10. Boaz is speaking, and he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. Ruth was not a man chaser, not a boy chaser. Interesting what he said. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. You talk about a reputation. For all the city, all the city will know. And I'm telling you, righteousness not only exalts a nation, righteousness exalts a city. Righteousness exalts a church or a Christian school. Out of all the students, there are those that rise to the top in strength and faith and character. And as I read those words to me for the first time, I remember reading them, though I've read the Bible through on numerous occasions. I was fascinated to hear, now my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee what thou requirest for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Now, when we think of a virtuous woman, we think of moral purity, and, and that's true. That's true. That's certainly a very strong connotation and meaning. And thank God for purity. I never thought I'd see a day when there's virtually nothing you can watch on television with a good conscience. And even in sports, you have to go through viewing things that would never be permitted years ago, but I'm not going to dwell there. We, we live in a society whose conscience has been numbed, and we're almost beyond shock unless you have been taught basic character in the things of God. But as I looked at this woman, it was expressed that all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Women on a mission. I'm behind this pulpit today because there was a woman called Jewel Nichols who was on a mission. And her mission was that not only was she married to R.V. Nichols and committed to my two brothers, but she knew that the call of God was on my life. And there was a, not a lengthy period, but longer than it should have been, time when I didn't do the things that I knew to do live the life that I knew to live. And I remember those words, and I, they, they, they come back instant replay. Son, I'm not going to let you go to hell. You'll go to hell over my praying body. <laughs> I mean, my mother had a, a strength of faith and character, and those that knew her, she was a very committed woman. I also stand at this pulpit because of her commitment to the things of God. Now, I love all denominations, and I think my upbringing gave me love and appreciation for all evangelical denominations and faith. But you know, I'm so thankful that my grandmother, my Baptist grandmother, came to Houston, and under the ministry of Raymond T. Ritchie, she said, I really realized that I'd never been born again. And she, was, she said, for the first time in my life as a businesswoman, I went to a church that said they were having a healing service and I needed healing. And so she, she went out to that service and she said, I went to receive healing because no one there would know who I was. And it wouldn't be a gossip back in the Baptist church back home that a good Baptist girl went to, a, you know, to a full gospel service. But she said, Sonny, she said, I was genuinely born again healed in my body, filled with the Holy Spirit, and received my prayer language. And she said, your grandmother came home from Houston back to 
Greenwood, Mississippi, a brand new woman. Now, I don't know of anyone here that remembers my grandmother, of course, except my own wife here, but when something happened with grandmother, she wanted the whole family to get involved. She was a salesperson. So she goes to the University of Texas where my mother and my aunt are attending uh, university there and nothing to do, but they've got to go to the church of Dr. W.J. Lucas, who was a spirit-filled Methodist now, and he's on fire for God, charismatic before his time. And my mother and my aunt were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then mother married a good old Baptist boy from Baylor, my father. And uh, they got married, and she said about two years, year and a half after I got married, she said, I felt like I was going to die. And the Lord said to me, what are you going to do about that Holy Spirit? Because what you're around is what you're going to rise up to. The books you read are what you're going to aspire to. What you hear is going to spark and inspire faith. Some people say, well, just anything will do. No, anything will not do. What you read affects your life. Where you worship affects your life. These things affect us in a vital way. And so my mother made a, a choice that was not real popular at that time. And uh, I won't go into all the, the things that happened then, but thank God I was dedicated by F.D. Davis, uh, a powerful Assemblies of God minister, and all the Davis family are powerful preachers. Over on Jennings Street, right behind the Catholic Church there, the building is no longer there. It was just a little tabernacle. But my mother from that point on began to pour into me what the Word said, what the Word said, what the Word said about being born again, about tithing, about living for God, putting God first, the power of the Holy Spirit. And I remember there was a time when I thought about going back and doing something else and I remember she prayed me through that time, and I got my, my head and my heart straight real quick. I mean, that was when I was back in, in my teen years. You know, there's so many turns in the road as to why we are where we are. And only God knows all the answers. I, I don't have all the answers. But I just thank God that in so many of our lives, really in all of our lives, if you'll really think about it, God had the right influence. He had the right message. He had the right minister. He had the right maybe friend or something there to keep you going in God's direction. And you know, folks, I'm not going back. I'm not going to compromise. Amen. I'm going forward in the things of God. And I'm the good part of wherever I am today because there was a grandmother, even as Timothy had a grandmother, and, and there was a mother. And some of you did not have that, but God's grace bridged the difference. So, you know, people praying in the Spirit have prayed for some of you. Some of you don't even know who's prayed for you. Some of you just think you just grew up strong and, and, and blessed and all of that. But somebody was praying in the Spirit, and there was not a name, and there was not an understanding of why they were praying, but they were praying for you in the Spirit, not knowing that. Who knows all the ministries that God has raised up and will continue to do that. Now, I want to go to the heart of the matter because I feel like God has given me some insight. In Ruth 311, I've already read that all the city will know that you're a virtuous woman. It said a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. A crown. A husband's crown is not the silver and gold of this world. Someone said if you have enough gold, you'll always make it. I'm going to tell you, if you have enough God, you'll always make it. Someone said gold has done well in every economy. Like something better than that, faith in God has done well in every economy. I remember a man that sowed in famine and he reaped a hundredfold in that year. So a virtuous woman is not only a woman of moral purity and a woman who doesn't get into what the television advertises or wear or look or whatever just because something is fashion. I, I, I never cease to be amazed at what they call fashion, which is just pornography about. Who can find a virtuous woman? Virtuous woman, listen to this now, is a woman not only of moral purity, but she is a force. Here's some definitions of this virtuous woman. She's a force. A force. She is powerful. And I'm telling you, even in life and in death, 
the faith of, of, of my mother and my grandmother lives on today, though their physical remains or at, or at Greenwood, but their spirit lives on today. There's a power, there's a force that is not only released in this life, but it's released for years to come. Remember the prophet of God, they threw someone into his sepulcher and from his dead bones, man comes, that'll get your attention. There was enough anointing in the prophet of God to bring life. So it's a force, it's powerful. Really, what I'm talking about, it's a one-person army. Amen. You know, remember Deborah back in the Old Testament? She was a one-person army. And she's a person of strength and might. She's a valuable woman, a woman of great value, a woman of riches. She's priceless. And so often her strength is in knowing what to say and what to speak and what not to speak. She is a woman on a mission in life, not afraid to be different, not afraid to be counterculture to Hollywood or fashions or current trends. Now let me give you some of these mothers and tell you why it's so important. Who gave birth to John the Baptist? A woman. Who gave birth to Jesus Christ, the Son of God? A woman. Who nurtured Jesus? A woman who surrounded Jesus' ministry and helped meet the ministry needs and minister to Jesus. A woman. A godly committed group of women who remained until the last moment possible at the cross. Women who came out on the first day of Jesus' resurrection and saw his empty tomb. Women. To whom did Jesus first speak after rising from the dead? Sending by them the message of the resurrection and a challenge that we hear even to this very day. Women who broke the alabaster box and gave Jesus his biggest offering that his ministry ever received. Who did that? A woman. Broke the alabaster box and gave what no one else could give. Or did give, I'll put it that way. You know, when you give away a year's wages, you're serious about giving. And I'll never forget the day in, in the church, and there were times we faced do or die. I mean, if God didn't come through, we, we were in severe jeopardy, and God brought us through. You know, isn't it amazing how God's brought us from a $40,000 post office building to a piece of land that's worth in excess of $20 million? I'm going to tell you, God's word works. I'm talking about school, church. I'm talking about the whole thing. God has brought just a little ragtag army from a $40,000 post office building. And we give God all the glory. Moved downtown for a million and a half. And then the years went by and with all of that. And then the property came back to, I don't know any church in the world that has more miracles to praise God for than we do. And I, I won't go there, though I'm tempted. I have a slow day, I just preach to myself. I just look in the mirror and I said, do you realize what God has done? I drove, do you, you remember that post office building? Do you remember Mephibosheth? Do you remember all the things that God's done? Do you remember when we moved downtown and it was just totally impossible and God brought us through? I mean, man, and to God be the glory. I wasn't trained to do that in Bible school. I can promise you that. Let's look at some of these mothers. First of all, the mother of Moses was on a mission, Exodus chapter 2. She could have said, you just can't, you just can't keep children in this day and time. World's too sinful. Things are too difficult. She could have just given up. Not the mother of Moses. Do you think that little basket was where it was and everything was right in place by accident? Not on your life. The mother of Moses, under the direction of God Almighty, was at the right place at the right time, and that baby was at the right place at the right time, and that daughter was at the right place at the right time. You see, 
She heard the words, take this child and raise it and I'll give you wages. Mothers, listen to me today. Take this child and raise it and I will give you wages. God pays wages for those who teach and train their children in the ways of God. God pays his bills. He pays wages. It's so important to know that God pays wages. There's a certain situation that has been of great concern to my heart. You know, God gave us children for reasons, very definite reasons. And mothers, and of course fathers come into this also, you don't have a greater mission field than your children. I'm going to preach to this crowd over here on this side of the book. You don't have a greater mission field than your children. And it all comes together. You don't have to ignore the house of God or the things of God. But I'm telling you, there is no greater mission field than the children that God has placed within your home. Didn't have many moments of regret of that nature but I remember when I was in junior high and there was a mother in junior high who was a very worldly mother husband was a professional man and I'll not give his profession but you know she was everywhere and she was always on top of everything it just she was just the the epitome of everything she was everywhere 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 and had money to do it and I remember one day I asked my mother I said mother why can't you be like this lady. And that's a moment I've thought about a number of times. She said, son, I'm doing something that's for, now she was involved. Don't get me wrong. My mother was not, not involved, but this lady was involved in ways of the world and actually getting the school involved in, in, in ways of the world that it shouldn't have been because she, that was her mindset. My mother said, son, I'm, I'm on a mission. I have children preach ahead of me and I thought about that many times she was on a mission she was not going to be like a person who was not even born again really didn't have good character really trying to get everybody off on another trail but she was on a mission mother of Moses was on a mission and she heard the words take this child and raise it and I will give you wages I will give you wages mother of Samuel was on a mission she was on a prayer mission. She was not only a teaching and training mission, and I'm not saying that the companions were not a part of this. I'm just saying the scripture talks to us about this. In fact, Hannah prayed so completely that they thought she was full of wine. They thought that she was intoxicated. And the priest even misinterpreted her prayer, thought she was intoxicated. But Hannah paid the price in prayer for her son and for a nation and for millions of people from that time until now. You see, it's not just for us and our four and no more. What you teach, what you train, what you pour into others, it not only touches your family, but it goes on and on and on and on. And we're still preaching about Hannah today. Just like the woman who you know, broke the alabaster box and so on. Jesus said, wherever this gospel is preached, her deed will be preached. And here I go doing it again. Millions and millions and millions of times an act of faith lives on today. In fact, an act of faith is never lost when it's done in the name of Jesus. But she paid the price in prayer. She paid the price in prayer. And she received that son. And you know, a lot of people, once the son was there, said, eh, excuse me, Lord, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I, I know you don't really take me serious on that. No, she kept her word. She kept her word. She was a woman. Her word was her bond. And a nation was blessed because of that. And I want to say it again, mothers, your greatest mission field is your own children. You know, I know Billy Graham has traveled all over the world, but he said it so many, many times. Thank God for Ruth Graham who raised children. And I know there was a time when their faith was challenged also. But you look at the Graham family today. Look at the Graham family. That mother has planted seeds in their lives that will live on. Well, the mother of Jesus was on a mission. Just a young girl minding her own business and the angel shows up. 
and declares that she's going to be the earth mother of Jesus. What a shock must have come to Mary's heart. But you know, when I look at Mary, she was a woman on a mission of let the Word of God happen in my life. Be it unto me according to thy Word. Whose Word? Is it the latest magazine on the rack or is it the latest program of this? Whose Word are you using to give guidance and training to your children? It's the Word of God that should be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. Can you say amen? Mother of Jesus was on a mission. He came into the home and thanked God for Joseph, a, a great man of God. But the Bible tells us that Jesus saw something in Mary and Joseph. Jesus saw something that he could entrust. The life, the seed, those early days of the Son of the living God. The mother and grandmother of Timothy were also on a mission. Second Timothy, I'll turn and I'll be there about the time many of you are there so we can read this together. But Paul was writing in chapter 2, 2 Timothy 2, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others. But he went on to say, there is a faith that is in you. Let's go back to the first chapter. He said in verse 5, chapter, uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded that is in thee also. Stir up the gift of God that is in you. You know, I don't remember looking up that unfeigned, but let me give you the meanings of unfeigned. When he said the unfeigned faith, something has been deposited. It's a solid faith. It's a solid faith. It's an undiluted faith. It's a faith that has no hypocrisy. It's a faith that doesn't change its doctrine daily. No hypocrisy. No pretense. Unfeigned faith is no pretense. What you see is what you get. It's unshakable. It's the real deal. <laughs> I put that one in. It's stability. I'm talking about a real Bible faith. And you know what Paul said to Timothy? He said, Timothy, there's some spiritual concrete that's been laid in your life by a grandmother and by a mother. It's unfeigned faith. And Timothy was a strong young man and did a tremendous job in life because of the faith that was placed within him. So I want to say not only to every mother, every teen, every single, every young married couple or those in the evening time of life. You know, some of you, you think, well, I'm going to go home and be with the Lord anytime. If God wanted you home, he would have already called you home. Don't get in a hurry on this go home business. It'll happen. But while you're here, we need your godly presence. We need your godly prayers. We need your godly influence. While you're here, we need what God has deposited in you. I can just think of some folks. I don't even have to hear them say anything. I can just think of some folks, and my spirit is encouraged. Amen. And I know you could say the same thing also. So the mother of Moses was on a mission. The mother of Samuel was on a mission, and their mission resulted in millions of people being touched then and even up to this day. Only God knows how many millions of people. The mother of Jesus was on a mission. Thank God for Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The mother and grandmother of Timothy were on a mission. Thank God for it. Let me summarize these comments by saying that these Bible women on a mission all had of something in common. Number one, they knew God. They knew God. They had a born-again experience. They knew God. Secondly, they had a strong faith in God. 
Your faith in God is so very important. Uphill, downhill, when you feel like it, when you don't feel like it. Good days, bad days. When it seems like prayers are answered, when it seems like they're delayed or denied. They knew God, knew Jesus as personal Savior. They had a strong personal faith in God. They had a strong purpose to do the will of God. You know, you meet some folks, it's just who got to them last. But God wants us to have that resolve and that purpose. No matter what anyone else does, no matter what happens, I'm going to serve God. And I was just thinking about what was poured into Timothy's life. Paul said, Timothy, you've been taught the right thing. Now, I don't know why just my foot hit this in, in the area where I study off times, and I haven't noticed it in quite a while, but you know, from my early preaching days, Bible college days, and ever since we've been pastor of this church now 41 years, this book by P.C. Nelson, Bible Doctrines, has been a book that we've built on, lived by, my doctrine hasn't changed. My doctrine has increased. I mean, my doctrine has become stronger. What I mean, I believe more strongly the things that I believed academically. And yes, my faith has grown. And yes, but you know, this church is built on the sound foundation of the Word of God. Always has been and always will be. We're building on the Word of God. I find enough to challenge me and what I already know. Some people always have to have a new revelation. And they're usually, <laughs> they're usually confused and don't know which way they're going. I don't live by the latest revelation. The latest revelation is the Word of God. And if I stay busy with what I read in this, I still read scriptures that challenge my spirit. It's impossible for me to read the Word of God without desiring to be a better believer, a better Christian better pastor, a better husband, a better father. My, my. They had a strong purpose to do the will of God, number three. Number four, they affected millions of lives for righteousness. Listen to me, child of God. Well, Brother Nicholas, does my life count? Yes. From this auditorium, your life has and is and if you'll continue to be faithful in your prayer, your finance, your commitment to a local body, if this is that body. But your faith is a partnership in reaching millions of lives. Think about that. I never in my wildest dreams in that little post office building, I mean, I had a big vision, but I, I could have never dreamed a dream as big as what God's done over these years. Never. Even in that youth revival, youth move that we had back then, there are young people scattered all over the world that have preached and taught and witnessed. You know, you're not sitting in the middle of small potatoes here. You're not in the midst of something that's neither here nor there. You're in something that on purpose is influencing and sowing seed and reaching out to do the word and the will of God. And it's happening. In fact, one of the seeds you've heard me tell it. Uganda businessman was on the island of St. Lucia. Saw our, our television program from Grenada. Not mine, but I mean the station that was there. Came over good Catholic man, but he'd never been born again. And there's a difference in being a Catholic and being born again. There's a difference in a Protestant and being born again. We're all born again just alike by faith in Jesus Christ. That man accepted Jesus and said, you've got to bring Christian television to Uganda. <laughs> and he goes back to Uganda, gets the license, and lo and behold, we all, today we're all involved in Lighthouse Television of Uganda. Through one man who heard the word of God, went home, and he wasn't everything he should have been, but he's still living for God, and God used him to help us get started in that. Listen, your very presence is planting a seed this morning. Your presence has already planted a seed. You have planted a seed the moment you put that key in the ignition and started for the house of God. 
You planted a seed when you walked in the door. You planted a seed when you sat down. You planted a seed when you shook someone's hand and said, God bless you. That's the first God bless you some folks have heard all week long. Your tithe, your offering, or if this was not your pay period time, you know, for an offering or a tithe. I'm telling you, the seeds that you've planted are not in vain. The seeds of our Christian school are not in vain. The seeds of the power tower are not in vain. The seeds that our staff are continually planting are not in vain. We don't see an immediate plant spring up. Sometimes we do. But we don't always see something immediately happen. But just as sure as you plant a seed in the name of Jesus Christ, I tell you that seed is coming out of the ground. Man, just the seed of my own life. Thank God for it. Thank God for the good part, Pastor Bob Nichols. And You know, everything we do, we're planting a seed. Everything we do, we're planting a seed. Every word we speak is planting a seed. What some of you are missing, I'm saying thus saith the Lord without getting all super spiritual about it. I'm telling you, your presence is a seed. Your word is a seed. Your faith is a seed. Your tithe is a seed. Your offering is a seed. Your presence is a seed. Every time you encourage someone, it's a seed. Every time you do the right thing, it's a seed. I said every time you choose to do the right thing, it's a seed planted. Every time, every time. Just as surely as there are women on mission, thank God there are men on mission in this auditorium today. There are boys and girls and teenagers on a mission. And you wait and see what God's going to do. Do you think those three Hebrew children thought they would be as famous as they've been since that moment? When they said, we will not bend, we will not bow, and we will not burn. We will do what's right. Do you think Daniel ever thought that his story would go all over the world for generations to come? That when he said, you tell me to stop praying, but if I stop praying, I die, so I take my chances. And Daniel continued to pray, and I'm still preaching about Daniel. Do you understand that the Bible story is preached today because someone was willing to plant a seed of obeying God in their generation. You might say, well, I'm not the greatest parent. I think all of us perhaps feel that way. I wish I could have done more. I wish I could have seen more. I wish I could have, but thank God you are who you are and what you are and you're planting seed and your life and your living is not in vain. So I thank God today. I thank God for you. Some of you I don't know like I know others. Some of you I've not met as yet. But I'm here to tell you that you're in the right place today. I know you're in the right place at the right time. And God's touch and God's hand is upon your life. You know, I, th I thought I'd be getting me a turbo rocking chair about now. Man, I'm working harder than I've ever worked for years. I've had a week of pastoring that I couldn't, I mean, and, and it's a lot of good things, but I mean, man, I've been a pastor from sun up till sundown and on up to midnight hour. It's been a week of really being a pastor, but you know, I did something, went out of line, do something a little bit the other night and, and, and someone said, well, do you feel like it? I said, you know, these people have poured 20 years into this church. Bless God. It's a privilege when I can to stand with somebody and to encourage them and to love them. Amen. We're not starstruck. We love people. The ministry is people. We love people. I can't do it all. That's why I have a loving, caring staff. But together we can do what we could never do apart. Together we can do what we could never do apart. Together we can win what we could never win apart. Together we can do missions in a way that we could never do apart. Today we can reach children and boys and girls and a lot of exciting things coming today. A Christian school, can you imagine a freestanding Christian school? Because we're together. And partners really do catch more fish. 